In this set of videos, I'm going to guide you through the key characteristics of archaeological pottery, discussing how to identify material using the skills you'll have picked up through the earlier videos on analysis. We'll talk about what it tells archaeologists about the societies who made the pots and how you can trace changes through time. The examples I'll be talking about are types that we encounter in the West Midlands, because that's where the project is based. There are some key differences between the nations and regions in Britain and Ireland, so bear that in mind if you're watching from elsewhere, but it should still be useful as an overview. For this first video, we'll be looking at prehistoric pottery. Now, the first thing we have to get past is the terminology. Prehistoric is often loaded with value judgments. We use it to mean outdated, remote, obsolete. But it's just a catch-all description for the people, environments and societies that existed in Britain prior to the arrival of an administration in the form of the Roman Empire in 43 CE that practised a particular form of public record. It doesn't mean people before that had no history, and it doesn't mean the transition was neat and precise. The earliest pottery we have in Britain dates from the early Neolithic. The Neolithic is the New Stone Age. In Britain, spanning roughly 4000 BC to 2500 BC. Pottery has traditionally been seen as one of the components of a Neolithic package. Domestication of plants for arable cultivation, domestication of livestock and sedentism. That is moving away from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to one in which you have a permanent home. Now that picture doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. In many parts of the world, hunter-gatherers made pots. In others, agriculture predated pottery by millennia. And even where pots and farming arrive at roughly the same time, 4000 BCE in Britain, people aren't necessarily settling into one place as we might understand it. Now it's very rare to encounter prehistoric pottery as a chance find. And there are a few reasons for this. One, population density was pretty low. Second, the sheer length of time it's been in the ground. Particular soil conditions, acidic soils, for example, can eat away a pot back to clay. There's sometimes a perception that they're weak because they're fired at a low temperature, but that's not necessarily true. It's more to do with the way they were fired, typically in open firings, either in a pit or bonfire. Now, these reach very high temperatures very quickly. You need a temperature of at least 550 to 600 degrees C for a pot to turn from clay to ceramic. But open firings are easily capable of reaching these temperatures. The danger moment is when the temperature passes 100 degrees and any water trapped within the clay boils, turns to steam and expands. If the proportion of water is too high or if it can't find its way to the surface, boom, great flakes pop off, or in extreme cases, the whole vessel explodes. That is why experimental archaeology is a specialism for the foolhardy. To combat this effect, prehistoric potters used opening materials, both natural inclusions in the clay, but also adding filler or temper. There's much ink spilled about the relative qualities of these, but generally it seems that potters used whatever they had to hand, Quartz, calcite, flint, sandstone, shell, or even ground up bits of old pots called grog. Most prehistoric pots were ring built. They took the natural clay, added whatever filler they had from local materials, and formed it into rings, gradually building up the body of the pot, carefully smoothing and joining each ring. Then they left it to dry, driving off as much of the moisture as they could, that there'd still be some trapped deep in the clay. Once it was leather hard, you could smooth or burnish the surface and add any decoration. Then they'd stack the vessels in a pit or bonfire, light it, and stand well back, hoping they'd added enough temper. If they had, that last bit of moisture would be able to escape safely. But that temper, whilst opening up the clay to allow water to escape during firing, creates weak points as did the joins of the clay rings, and often, if you find prehistoric sherds, they'll have broken around a big inclusion or along a ring join. Key characteristics shared by most prehistoric pots are patchy or inconsistent surface colour, 
usually ranging from earthy tones, red, orange, beige, and brown, with patches of grey or black where the surface has come into contact with flames. And the core will very often be dark black. Because these bonfire firings heat up and cool very quickly, often taking less than an hour, the centre of the pot will frequently not be fully fired. And because there's often still material there that's not fully fired, prehistoric pottery will sometimes reabsorb moisture in the ground and revert to clay. When you're excavating sites with prehistoric pottery, there's this phenomenon where you'll see a shirt of pottery appearing at the trowel's edge. You'll go to recover it and it's just dissolved into a smear of clay. So that's why it's rare. But it's not unheard of and prehistoric pottery does turn up in test pits and in field walking finds. So what does it look like? Neolithic material really is rare. Generally speaking, the early Neolithic pots are hemispherical bowls with rounded bottoms and sometimes a shoulder, neck and averted, outturned rims, forming an S-shape near the top of the vessel, part of a wider tradition stretching across Western Europe. These earliest vessels are usually undecorated. There's something else a bit curious about them. They often have very fine walls and would have been really difficult to make. They're not the untutored experimental efforts you might expect from the dawn of an industry, which suggests that these were made by people who are either themselves arriving from the continent or were close to and learning from those who had. Towards the middle part of the fourth millennium BCE, decorations started to become much more common and more elaborate. And then you got the emergence of impressed wares. The forms stayed similar, round-bottomed bowls, but there was a greater range of decoration, with all sorts of materials being pressed into the clay, cord, bone, nails, to create elaborate patterns. And this is a tradition that's sometimes called Peterborough ware. Here's an example of a shirt from Schiffnell in Shropshire. These styles were adapted locally using local clays and materials. Many of the examples from the West Midlands have distinctive, very large inclusions, and these often burst through the surfaces to give them a speckled appearance. So this is fabric 5.8, quartzite tempered ware. And this is actually quite a well-fired example, but you can see these big, chunky, angular rock fragments. At the turn of the third millennium BCE, a new style called grooved ware emerged. Again, common the length of Britain, but adapted locally. These examples are from Clifton Quarry, just south of Worcester. These vessels had flat bases and straight, slightly sloping sides with panels of diagonal grooves. With the dawn of the Bronze Age, about 2500 BCE, you got the arrival of the beaker, for a long time synonymous with the whole culture of these early metalworking pioneers, Again, this is a style that arrived fully formed from the continent, then developed and changed in all sorts of ways. These tend to be thin, fine-walled vessels with few big, chunky inclusions. And the decoration varied, but most examples in this area, now here are two from the last decade of work in South Worcestershire, from Aldington and Broadway, have these bands and chevrons formed from tiny dot impressions. Bronze Age pottery here frequently has quite a soft, soapy feel. You get bigger vessels too, like this large urn from Shropshire, and they often contain or mark cremations, but there's not really a clear divide between what's a cremation urn and what's not. Let's take a little look at one of the most common fabrics which spans the Bronze Age in this part of the Severn Valley. This is fabric 4.8 and it's chock full of fossil rich Shelley limestone. Into the late Bronze Age, in the early first millennium BCE, there was an increasing complexity and range of forms. Now it's unlikely you're gonna come across large sherds that give you the profile of the pot. So to keep things simple, we'll focus on the fabrics. Now our data here, and the fabrics in the Worcestershire online series, have a geographic bias towards south and southeast Worcestershire, especially along the Avon Valley, and that's because a lot more Bronze and Iron Age sites have been identified and excavated along there. Fossil shell-tempered wares are particularly common. 
Several parallel traditions developed in the latter half of the early Iron Age in the Severn Valley. And these are worth looking at because they're long lived and the pots spread quite a distance. And they illustrate some of the difficulties of identifying prehistoric pot. First, you have Mulvernian wares, Fabric 3. These are usually black or grey throughout, and they have large angular fragments of quartz and Mulvernian rock. These might appear pinkish or white with dark veins running through. They're especially common from around 400 BCE through to around 100 BCE, though variants continue in use all the way through the Roman period, which we'll look at when we cover Roman material. Decoration, usually in the form of incised lines, is pretty common on Iron, Iron Age pottery, but in Britain it's almost always abstract. But these Mulvernian pots often have a band of impressions just below the rim that is said to represent swimming ducks. Now sometimes they can be a bit dubious, but here is a lovely example and they do look very duck-like. So far, a lot of the identifications rest on figuring out the inclusions, but sometimes they've disappeared. Another very common temper is limestone. Paleozoic limestone tempered ware, probably made in Herefordshire, but found as far away as the central Cotswolds, is another type made from the 5th century BCE all the way into the Roman period. Very often the limestone has dissolved, and it has this cratered appearance, covered with tiny voids. The difficulty with voids is it's hard to be sure what was originally there. Sometimes snipping a clean break can help, but you can also look at the size and shape of the voids. If they're long and thin, it might be grass and straw mixed with the clay that's burnt out during firing. If they're rounded, it might be oolitic limestone from the Cotswolds. The Paleozoic limestone will tend to leave irregular and quite angular voids. I'm going to cover the very late Iron Age material alongside the Roman, for reasons that will become clear in that video. So I'll just end with a few tips on dealing with this material if you think you might have some prehistoric pot. Sherds will typically feel quite crumbly and prone to falling apart in your hand. You might be keen to get them cleaned up, but don't dunk them in water. Best to keep them as close as possible to the condition in which you found them. If that is damp and dark, then wrap them up and keep them damp and dark. Low acid tissue paper in a grip seal plastic bag is ideal, but use what you have to hand. I'd avoid kitchen or loo roll, it tends to stick to surfaces. Get in touch with a specialist as soon as possible. With prehistoric pot, it's always important to report it to your fines liaison officer or local historic environment record, because if there's one shared, there'll likely be more. And if you think you might have more than just a stray shared and you've hit some prehistoric deposits, get some advice before you continue. Not least because with prehistoric pot, there could be a chance you've got human remains either in it or nearby. Finally, some good resources. Prehistoric Pottery for the Archaeologist talks through the technology, the chronology, and has a really well illustrated dictionary of key types and terms. For replicas, courses, and wonderful insights into the making process, check out the work of Graham Taylor and Sarah Lord at Potted History. Their work is such a brilliant insight into the process of making, and if you really want to understand the craft, you've got to get under the skin of the potter. Join me again soon for another episode on Roman pottery. Thanks for watching.